Hello everyone and welcome to the Curious Mind podcast. My name is Gabriel Ellis, I'm a psychotherapist and Buddhist scholar, and in this podcast I take deep dives into complex psychological topics that affect our well-being in general. Today I have the pleasure to talk with Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert is living in Los Angeles as a director and producer. And among many other things and projects, he produced extra material for the DVD releases of Lord of the Rings and Star Trek Next Generation. He's a well-rounded movie enthusiast and discusses movie-related topics in the widest sense with his audience on his YouTube channel, The Burn Network, and is a regular guest on the YouTube John Campier Show. Welcome, Rob. It's great to be here. I, I appreciate you asking me, all, all from around the world. It's amazing. One of the many epithets you have is the Duke of Dope Discourse, which is a good segue. A discourse is, to put it simply, what is commonly spoken about and how. So it's closely related to what is called zeitgeist, or spirit of the time. And this is not a small thing. The discourse can free our mind, literally, to think beyond what is expressed in our circle of friends, our family, or the workplace. And since the invention, movies, films, and TV have greatly contributed to what the discourse is and what we can think and fantasize about, just as books did in previous centuries. They literally opened our world of imagination. But the discourse can also limit our way of thinking. For example, it can create very narrow ideas about how to live life, how to love, and how to lead relationships. Now, Rob... I know you see the close relationship between the discourses in movies and entertainment on the one hand and what we do and think as individuals on the other. How would you describe the state of affairs these days? What are the discursive contributions of the entertainment industry to how we live our daily lives? That's a fantastic question. Um, Unfortunately, I think, obviously, living in America, Hollywood's output still dominates the world and and there's hollywood movies are played uh, are played everywhere so what hollywood decides to give to the world i think is something that definitely um (laughs) is is of concern these days because when i was growing up for instance when i was a child of the 70s there was all kinds of very diverse films being released by the studios you might get romantic comedies. You might get political thrillers, like a movie like Network that was written by Patty Chayefsky, which has become very prophetic. Uh, you might get a movie like All the President's Men, which is a, a docudrama about how the Watergate um, break-in was, was uh, broken open and how they discovered who was responsible for it, and it led to the downfall of President Nixon. These were movies that were all celebrated, and everybody went and saw them. And there was a diversity of topics and whether like the post Vietnam movies that came out like the deer hunter or coming home, which were movies I saw in the late seventies, then you'd get a great movie like all that jazz, which was uh, Bob Fosse, who was a dancer and choreographer on Broadway, who later became a film director. It was a meditation on his own life and art and what all that meant. These were all movies that were coming from the major studios and people were going they were making money and there was a diversity of topics and they had, there were great uh, reviewers, movie reviewers like Pauline Kael who would write eloquently on what these movies meant and they would be analyzed by people that had backgrounds in literature and art history. Nowadays, uh, the movie output from the studios has changed a great deal. Nowadays, the the movies that are the biggest movies around the world are, say, the Marvel superhero movies. And while I love those Marvel superhero movies, I do, they they don't have a lot to say about our everyday lives. And they're not really commenting anymore on the political times. Now, that's not to say a movie like Captain America, the Winter Soldier, isn't talking about surveillance and isn't talking about government oversight and the fact that there could be corruption at the highest levels of government. That's all well and good, 
but it does so in an overtly fantasy context. So it's, we're not dealing, I think, in the public arena, in our public entertainments, especially movies coming out of Hollywood, those questions that used to be asked of culture in the 70s are not being asked by Hollywood anymore. And the reason for that is because now movies are a truly global business. And the movies that Hollywood have to make or has to make in order to be viable has to appeal to the widest demographic on a global scale. And so movies that are overtly political or, or, or might be about um, the plight of people, uh, you don't see a lot of that on the studio level. There's a lot of that going on in independent films, but what we are exporting to the world in terms of our Hollywood output has become let's just say a little limited in terms of the subjects that, that we're covering. And I, in my mind, in terms of discourse, in terms of the questions that are being asked by the movies that we're putting out to the world, uh, I don't think there's a lot of questions being asked. I don't think there's a lot of, uh, of answers being put forth either. Sure, they're wildly entertaining and everybody has a good time and, and they, you come out of, a movie like Endgame, Thanos is defeated, the universe goes back to the way it used to be and everybody has a big smile on their face. But I don't think the next day you can sit in a cafe necessarily and contemplate what we've learned from what is now the biggest movie ever made, which is Avengers Endgame. Now that's not to say you can't discuss Thanos's philosophy, like I wanna get rid of half of the beings in the universe, but I don't think that really applies to everyday life. You know, uh, and I grew up in a world where movies were sort of the primary text of my life. I mean, obviously I read a lot, but it was movies that sent me on a journey of discovery. Like you'd, I didn't really know much about Bob Fosse when I saw all that jazz. And I was 12 years old when I saw it. And it was all really about everything. It was about life and art and love. And how, how do you, how do you balance family life? And if you're a passionate artist, how do you do all of those things? And I was 12 in this movie. It's still one of my favorite movies. It was hugely impressionable on me. And then I, it led me to find out, well, who is Bob Fosse? I didn't know he was a Broadway choreographer. And then I went back and watched his other movies like Cabaret that he made before that and Sweet Charity before that. And I learned, I learned about his Broadway career. This is thing. These are things I, Never would have known had I not seen this movie. And when I was watching movies growing up, there were a lot of movies like that. A lot of movies that dealt with historical events, like The Killing Fields and what happened in Cambodia during the Vietnam War, or Amadeus. You know, even though it was based on Peter uh, Schaefer's play, I went back and started listening to Mozart, you know, yeah. and reading about his life. And, and that's what movies did for me growing up. And, and, and talk in terms of what, what you said about discourse, the more you know about things, the more you realize that the world is such a rich and wonderful place, the more you're apt to listen to other voices, you know, other voices and, and what they have to say and where they came from and their experience. And it, it sort of helps you understand the world in which we live in. I mean, I think so often people, we live in small towns or cities, and, but we're still limited by our experience of the world, by the bubbles that we live in. And movies are the one thing that can show us other, other, well, other neighborhoods. If you live, if you live in New York, movies sometimes are about one neighborhood in New York that you've maybe never gone to. I mean, especially if you grow up in another part of the world, it's like, I need to go to Brooklyn and see where like mean streets took place, you know, or whatever. And, and I think that, that, and the one thing about movies, like I've always said is that, um, when you, when you go into a movie theater, you're sitting with 500 or 1,000, if you're in a big theater, 1,000 strangers, that you don't even know them. And yet you've all come to experience this story together. And when the lights go down, if it's a comedy, you laugh together. If it's a thriller, you all <gasps> gasp when something happens, all of you collectively. And movies, I think the experience of going to the movies tells people that love movies that even though we're all from different walks of life, there is a certain connective tissue that all of us have, which is 
We all love these stories. We're all here for the same reason. I don't know any of these people in the movie theater, but they all came to see the same movie that I came to see. So there's a commonality in all of us. And if the movie's really good, you know, you walk out, you can talk about it with people. You, you, you know that there's other, I mean, it's not something you might be consciously aware of, but you've walked out of a room with all these other people and you've had an experience. And I think the same is true for a lot of art. Like when you go see a concert, a classical concert, or you go see a ballet, or you go to a museum or even a reading at a bookstore, yeah. the people that go were, were, we go to these things to hopefully have our, our minds broadened and opened up. And I think, unfortunately now, there's so much money involved on a global scale that mm -hmm. the stories that we're getting are less diverse. I, and I mean the stories from Hollywood, the stories that the big studios are giving to all of us. And that's not to say there isn't wonderful movies coming out. When a Pixar animated movie comes out, it's a wonderful film. And there is a lot to chew on. And there is something to be gleaned or learned from it. But we're not getting, we're certainly not getting the kind of exciting and diverse and human stories that we used to get uh, when I was growing up. And I think in a way- to me, yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, what's interesting to me is that when, before I started the recording, we spoke about how today, because of technology, there is a possibility to develop a more global mindset and openness to all the possibilities around the world. Now, what I wonder is, okay, so the, um, the studios, they try to go global with the turnover for the movies. Is it possible to link that to a, to a global discourse that would be enriching on a global scale? Or is it necessarily so that once you, you, know, once you make movies that are as appealing for Chinese people as for Europeans and Americans, that somehow that cancels each other out so that you are kind of left with the lowest de denominator and not with something that is enriching for everyone? Well, I, I think that what's interesting is as movies have gone global over the last 20 years, we've also had the rise of incredible communications technology, smartphones and YouTube. And what something like YouTube has, or Zoom, the platform you and I are recording on right now, is it's allowing everybody to have a voice. Hmm. And there's, there's, when you sit down, it, when you watch a movie that's 90 minutes or two hours, or you watch, say, two hours of YouTube videos, it's the same amount of time. You know, you're investing the same amount of time. Like, I could watch a movie that, that two hours might have cost $200 million to make. And then I could watch two hours of YouTube videos of people all over the world, voices I would never have heard had I not been on YouTube. And they might be telling me, I was telling you, I, I watch a, a guy who, who knows how to paint with an airbrush in Korea. He doesn't speak English. I, I, his channel isn't subtitled in, in English. I don't even know what he's saying. He's just a brilliant painter. And I find his channel mesmerizing. I could watch him paint models for two hours. It costs me nothing. It doesn't cost him much. And yet you've got a $200 million movie and a guy using an airbrush in Korea that I can't even speak to or understand. And yet it's still two hours of my time. Hmm. It's two hours that I'm never going to get back. And the question is, you ask, what's more valuable? And is there a way to sort of make that discourse? I, I really think that what's happening now is people are realizing that other voices, listening to other people talk and uh, hearing their opinions is almost becoming, it. look, it was something that was new that we couldn't hear 20 years ago. It didn't exist. Movies existed, but certainly technologies like YouTube did not. This is a new thing. Uh, they've built a global interconnected system where I can, uh, you're in Poland right now. I'm in Los Angeles and we're talking in real time to one another, recording this conversation. And I would rather be talking to you about these topics than watching a movie right now. So I think the question that needs to be asked is how long are people going to value movies? 
And what is it for how much longer? Like, look, I love Flights of Fancy, but when we have our movies, like for instance, Star Wars is a really great example. When Star Wars was originally made in 1977, when it came out, nobody knew, even George Lucas thought he escaped to Hawaii because he thought the movie was going to be a failure. He didn't think it was going to be good. 20th Century Fox, who made it, they didn't know if it was going to be good. I mean, George Lucas was coming off of American Graffiti. The movies were not pre-marketed. They were not pre-sold. They really, they, you had a, a, somebody at a studio agreeing or believing in basically one person and their vision. Like, this sounds good. Let's make this and let's see what happened. Because they're not, they, back then they weren't spending $200 million. So when Star Wars came out originally, it was really the visionary thoughts of one man and the people, the collaborators he had to work with him. Now, if you cut to now, 2019, Star Wars has been bought by Disney, which is a publicly held multinational corporation. And the stories that are now being told within the Star Wars realm, you have multi-generations of people who love Star Wars, but the stories themselves are no longer the part or the vision of one man or one woman. They're corporately mandated stories that have to fit in to the entire corporate interests. We have to be able to make games and theme park rides and we have to make a billion dollars when it comes out so we can have toys and apparel and all this stuff so the story that was being told in star wars is no longer even about the story that's being it's about the brand that they're selling and so the story that we're getting isn't a genuine story it's a story that has been decided upon by a committee and i think that ultimately that people are eventually, because these stories, they don't even know why, but these stories aren't satisfying anymore because you can't tell, a story needs an author. And I think the great stories have authorship to them. You really feel that you're getting a a human being's point of view. Whether you read an amazing story from from, uh, literature or, or like in Poland right now, one of my favorite filmmakers is Krzysztof Koslowski. And he made a series of movies for Polish television called the Decalogue, where he made 10 movies, each about one of the 10 commandments. Amazing. But they came from him, you know, and they will stand the test of time because, you know, it wasn't like Polish TV said, well, you have to make these stories this way. He, no, when you, when you watch the Decalogue there, his interpretation about how did he apply the ideas that are in each of the 10 commandments to the modern day when they were made and that's what made them interesting that's what made them fascinating to other people because there was human truths in those stories because they came from a person who was bringing their own experience and i think that's what whether people could knew this or not that's what movies used to be i mean they used to bring a perspective that felt that there was a reality to them i mean even novels when people write novels even though they're made up if they're truthful, just because something's made up doesn't mean it can't have truth in it. And the great novels speak to those human truths. But now I wonder, can corporate entertainment that's been designed to specifically make money by appealing marketing departments say, well, this movie has to have these different, these 10 points in order to be successful on a global scale. Well, by doing that, you're, you're, you're bleeding out what makes stories appealing in the first place, which is those human truths that you're, you're getting. Now, at the same time, you have the rise of this kind of discourse around the planet where people can upload their thoughts, whether you're watching you know, somebody talking about shopping in a market in Vietnam, or they're talking about architecture in, in France. Let's take a walking tour of Florence. And I've never, I've never been to Florence. I want to walk, uh, watch a walking tour. Of, how amazing. There's YouTube channels about people that have, like I watched this, this channel with a, a guy who w- was in the tech industry and he married a Swedish girl and they bought a boat, you know, and they just travel around the world and go places. And I'll watch that channel. And I find that to be just as enriching as, as any movie. Yeah. So the question is, as we move forward into the 21st century, what is it that people want? 
And, and I think what people want is what they've always wanted. They want real meaningful connection. And whether it's to a story uh, or a movie, you know, people love movies, comfort movies. You know, you ha- everybody has favorite movies that they'll watch over and over again because there's something in those movies that speak to people. But what people really want is connections to other people. And they want, I think, what they've never had before and which is this technology that we have. I mean, even the smartphones we can carry around and we can see people's faces now on the other side of the world if we want. And, and I think it's amazing. And I think if we're not careful, um, the idea of profit making money, which is fine, but it can't be the only thing. And eventually if stories lose their truth because the stories that are being told are only told because of commercial issues, no one's going to watch those stories anymore because they're not getting those truths. This is <clears throat> actually, there's a satisfying aspect for me to have seen in the past year or two years, big production movies failing. I mean, it's, uh, I know it's bad when, when a movie fails, but sure. it's kind of a reminder for the studios that it's, there is no formula. You cannot just produce action sequences uh, big stars, put them somehow together in a jumbled screenplay and people will come and watch it because I hope that they get the message out of it that no, it has to be really more and maybe better. And on the other hand, also good movies, they don't always succeed. But when I look back, movies like Arrival, it's a fantastic movie because it brings up, you know, this this uh, old science fiction topic of how to communicate with aliens to a, a great level that is feasible because of technology and, and the CGI, but it's challenging when, because I, I watch it and I'm thrown back to the positions like, what would I do? Well, that's, it's so, that's what the best movies do. They make you as a viewer wonder if I was in this position, if I was Amy Adams, what would I do? Yeah. And if you think about the great movies, I, with my girlfriend, we, we just watched Jaws, 40th uh, anniversary of Jaws. And every time I watch, first of all, I love Jaws, but you can't help but watch Jaws and wonder if I was Sheriff Brody, you know, on this island, would I handle this crisis the same way that he did? And I think that the great movies always put you in that position. They make you, whoever you identify with as the protagonist of the film, you can't help but wonder, you ask yourself as the movie goes along, would I make that choice? You know, and, and nowadays when you're getting movies that are so constructed, mm. you don't feel a connection to the protagonist because you know that it's all just, I mean, movies are all just a construct, but they trick you into believing in them. Right. And, and nowadays I think the movies aren't, they're so artificial, you know, and now the technology exists. Like we don't even have to go shoot outside anymore. We can shoot on a sound stage and, I think eventually that's going to come back and it's, it's going to eventually people are not going to like that. I mean, if you go to Europe, I want to see people walk down the streets. Like I like James Bond movies because they always are set in places I've never been. Hmm. I want to go to the, the, the casino and Casino Royale and Montenegro. And I, I want to go there. I want to, what is it like to go into that casino? And that's why I think people like watching James Bond movies, but now if James Bond doesn't go to real locations because they're on sound stages and they use technology to recreate things, we will know, you know, eventually there, and, and, and uh, you don't, you don't want that. And people are going to go to other entertainment mediums. They're going to get as much, as much out of their time. Like, again, I can, I've got two hours. How am I going to spend my two hours of my life? It's your life. It's two hours you're, it, 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 when the two hours are over, you're that much closer to your own mortality. Those are two hours you're never going to get back. And if movies fail to engage people anymore, they're not going to watch. Yeah. I'll go to YouTube and, and listen to, like you can go listen to a philosopher on YouTube talk for three hours. I, I find myself going and watching old interviews of people or uh, fascinating uh, uh, things with people that are like oh, Christopher Hitchens talking about God or something and he's no longer with us. And yet there's a YouTube record of, of hundreds of talks that he gave and you can, you can see these things. And I think people are going to start doing that more and more. 
if I interpret you correctly, you seem to be carefully optimistic, and I'm I'm not quite sure if I can share this. So we both see a decline, kind of, in, in what uh, especially studio movies contribute to the discourse in the sense that they open our minds to think in a different different way. They confront us with realities that uh, kind of force us to think differently. So that is going down uh, for the sacrifice uh, to sacrifice for marketability, but then. I guess you're saying that there is something in us that wants that. So eventually I'm making use more of these alternative media because my need of getting my mind blown and for very similitude, a term that you like, which is the drive to see something that is more or less real, yeah. that it will drive people to those media uh, like YouTube. Well, I agree. You know, often when I, I, I have Netflix, but often I, I'm quite, I'm pre-bored, as I say, by the idea of watching something, and I'd rather put on something on YouTube, because there's a real person talking to me, not in the most kind of flamboyant, extravagant CGI way, that I would love to have the combination of these, but in the end, I prefer, you know, something that I can relate to, and even though I would love to see, you know, a blockbuster that gives me both. I, I completely agree. I, I always, I'll tell you why I'm optimistic because <clears throat> in the 1960s, the movie studios were still trying to make what they were making in the forties and fifties, which were musicals and all of these kind of fluffy entertainments. And at the same time, you had the civil rights movement happening. There was student uprisings on the streets of America. There was the Vietnam War where people were, American audiences were now seeing body bags and dead Americans come on the nightly news. And so, and then the rise of things like rock and roll and the counterculture and Hollywood just wasn't keeping up. And they were failing, the studios were failing. And then you had all these young maverick directors making movies like Coppola came and like uh, Dennis Hopper was in Easy Rider. And there was a lot of these, these counterculture directors that were products of this time. They sort of came into Hollywood and shook things up and changed the status quo. And the 60s gave way to the 1970s, which is arguably, I think the 1940s and the 1970s were the best and most vibrant period, especially the 70s of American cinema where there was also at the time there was an influx uh, in the 60s it started but there was an influx of foreign films too that were influencing american directors and there was a lot of a lot of things happening and i think what's happening now especially in in america there's a lot of far left and and postmodern thought especially in academia but now it's spilled out into culture where discourse is being it's frowned upon that everybody only you can only think a certain way and everybody that the 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 idea of true different everyone talks about diversity but they don't really mean it diversity is about different modes of thinking and you you have to be open to all points of view you can't just say this point of view is wrong that isn't diversity at all you know everybody wants to to, to sort of stop that kind of that flow of discourse like we talked about just because something or someone you, you, you don't agree with it, you shouldn't get rid of it. You should be able to discuss it because bad ideas will be eliminated through the examination of those ideas so they can be deemed, they have to, have, they have to be able to be examined because if you, just, if you just get rid of an idea before it's had its day in court, so to speak, it'll it'll never be thought about enough like people will not be able to under a bad idea needs to be understood so you understand why it's a bad idea but in america you can get in trouble now if you say you you make one wrong tweet somebody comes and jumps all over you you might have a hundred thousand other tweets that you've made but if you make one tweet that everybody the mob decides well that's that's terrible you shouldn't think that way They'll come after you for your one tweet. But what about the other hundred, the 900 or 99,999 tweets I made? What about those? Yeah. And nowadays it's, it's a very weird place that we're in. And I think what's going to happen is 
and I believe like it might, it might get bad. It always gets bad, but I think ultimately we will prevail and hopefully the world doesn't descend into horrible fascism and, and ideological terrorism and, and real terrorism and all that, that, that it will, I, I really believe that these new communications mediums and the fact that people can now talk to one another, uh, whenever they want all over the world are, are the, uh, it, that's what's going to make, that's what's going to keep the world from exploding. I mean, it's funny listening to people talk about, you look at what went on in World War II in Europe and in Asia, well, it was a lot worse than it is now. That's not, not to say that we're not having all kinds of tribal conflicts all over the world. And here in America, there's a lot of tribalism. You were talking about it before we went on we're recording today. But the world isn't burning down. I mean, climate change is bad, but the, the, you don't have entire countries being invaded and we don't have, there, there's, there's I, I do believe I am optimistic because I do believe that communications technology is the, the one thing, communication between people is the one thing that will save us. And now, we have better communication than we've ever had before. And, yes. and people are talking to each other all over the world more than ever. And especially now that with this global pandemic raging and people are staying home, now we have this technology, like I didn't know what Zoom was six months ago. And now you've got multiple, you can talk to, you can have a party on Zoom, 50 people around the world. You can have a family reunion and, and, and this kind of technology. On the one hand, people could say, oh, it's going to be used to dominate us and tell us all what to think. Well, as long as we keep the internet free, and I mean free, a free space that it's not regulated, it's not choked off by countries that want certain ideologies only, uh, I, I am optimistic because all the good that's come out of humanity has always come out of our cooperation with one another, our collectively, uh, and I'm not even a collectivist guy, but projects are done. You can't build a house by yourself. I mean, I guess you can, but it's always better when you have a group of people building things and creating things and making communities and working together and, and experiencing thoughts of others and, and, you know, I use, I always use the example. Um, <laughs> I always say that wouldn't it be great if we could get all the moms in the world together and make their favorite dish and we could all sit down to a meal and, and eat and experience everyone's mom's favorite meal. Now, if I said that today in America, people would say, well, Rob, are you saying that all women should just be in the kitchen making food? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? And I'm like, no, that's Sorry. not what I'm saying. Uh, let, me, let me say your aunt, your father, whomever. The point is, is that every family has their favorite dish. But in America, people would say, well, what about those kids that don't have families? I'm like, okay, yeah. I, I understand. I would hope though, that rather than argue, the point being, let's make it, can we all, if we could all sit down at a meal and have say a different people from different countries bring their favorite dishes, however you want to put it that makes it palatable to your thought. The overarching idea is let's get a bunch of different food, sit down where we all get to eat and talk because everybody will sit down at a meal and have a drink and talk. It's the one place where that in a movie theater where people won't, won't, hopefully they won't start screaming at each other, but eating together puts a smile on everyone's face. And that's a good way to start talking. Yes. And, and I, you know, I'm optimistic. Yes. I, uh, I'm afraid I'm a little more pessimistic by my <laughs> nature, uh, but it's, it's interesting because it's, um, it highlights the, the different aspects that are at play at, at the same time. So, I see that the diversity in, on YouTube, for example, uh, contributes to a much greater deal to the discourses that, that contribute to my state of mind than before. Uh, and at the same time, the, the influence of, uh, of state media, of corporate media, of uh, studio movies and so on is waning. Uh, mm. So there are two things here that are important for me 
which is on the one hand, doesn't it make the, the, the danger of echo chambers on the internet extremely big and frightening because those echo chambers that are basically self, uh, self-organized self through algorithms, uh, this is just an effect of how the algorithms on, on YouTube or, or Facebook, whatever, are programmed, they, uh, as, as they are right now, they necessarily create echo chambers because I get forced fed um, the recommendations of things that I have similarly seen before. So if, if I'm concerned with what I'm able to think and the diversity that I have in my mind, it automatically kind of connects with a political concern to uh, liberate those algorithms. I would mm-hmm. like to to get random recommendations, which would be something like zapping back in the days with TV, mm-hmm. so that I, I zap to a different channel and I have no idea what comes. And sometimes I'm I stick there because oh, that's actually interesting what I see there. So it's it's fascinating to me that those highly personal uh, kind of fields, the ability to dream and fantasize and think are so intrinsically connected with a politicized and political and economical topic, which is the algorithms of the internet. How, how do you see possibilities to resolve these or bring this to an optimistic outcome? Again, these are fantastic questions that you're asking. Um, on one hand, I have to say, I too see there's an incredible danger in the exploitation of these communication systems. And ultimately, I guess here's the thing that I am, what makes me ultimately optimistic, because at the end of the day, eventually people are going to realize that even being in those echo chambers, they're not getting anything out of it ultimately. They might get affirmation. They might sit in their house and sit on their computers, or they're going to watch these programs but eventually they're going to step out of their homes one day and they're going to go to the park or they're going to go to the beach or they're going to go to the grocery store. They're going to go someplace where they've moved out of these echo chambers and they realize, wow, I, I like being outside. You know, I like seeing other people. I like going to a bar or a pub and talking to somebody that I've never talked to before. I like the random nature of what you were talking about, clicking through the channels and finding out. I think eventually these echo chambers are so um, ultimately they're fulfilling initially, but they're not necessarily enriching because they don't take you anywhere. I mean, the idea that, Oh, there's going to be revolution and we're going to change society or something maybe, but in order to do that, you still have to get up out of your chair and out of away from your computer. And if you really want to be a revolutionary, you've got to open the door to your front door to your house and leave. And once you go out into the real world, and the real world will, will bring you back to reality, at least I hope, um, because the real world is, is, everybody wants the world to be the way they think it should be, but it isn't. The world is the way it really is, which is, it, the world doesn't care about you. You know, the universe is indifferent. And, and the cosmic void that we swirl through all day long None of it matters. And, and I think that when you, when you get out there and you have a little taste of the world, the randomness of life will somehow creep back in. I mean, look, I don't want to live in some 1984 brave new world nightmare when we're all narcoticized and our free thought is gone. And I, I don't believe we'll ever get to that point, even though it probably seems like we will. Because at the end of the day, I think human beings, the human spirit will eventually win out because there's only so many, like if you're a consumer in America, there's only so many pairs of sneakers that you can buy. There's only, there's only so many cars you can drive. There's, and, and eventually it leads you nowhere. And, and we're all moving through our lives. We're always getting our, our closer to our mortality every single day. So the corporations are going to have to I mean, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but they expect to make more and more and more money every year. Well, eventually there's going to be, especially living now, there's going to be no more money with with every corporation trying to achieve enormous profit. There's only so much money that people are generating in the world. 
And it's got to the point where it's like, there's no more profit to be made. You know, there's, there's nothing left. You, you can only build on your, the human population so much before the human population is itself the ultimate natural resource. And it's finite. You know, you can make more people, of course, but eventually the food, the, the land, I mean, all of this is not sustainable. And eventually, I think somehow it will be, we will break free of all this. And eventually people will just get tired of the kind of, like right now in America, it's like you have Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, hopefully somebody watches the BBC. There really is, yeah. there is not a lot of nuance in our public discourse here in the United States. Right. But I think eventually people are going to get tired of that. And this new, look, we're only, what, 20 years in, there, there's been smartphones for not even 15 years. And the, this kind of YouTube mindset, this corporate controlled entertainment news, whatever it all is, is fairly new. And we're in an evolutionary period of time. And I think eventually, I don't know what's going to happen. There will be some kind of, hopefully it'll be a peaceful revolution. The people are just going to get tired of it all. They're going to get tired of being angry all the time. And they're going to get tired of yeah. not being able to, to, the, 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 the chickens will come home to roost, as we say. There's going to be a massive shift and people are going to want something else because that's what always happens in human history. You know, I, whether, whether you had the, the rise of communism in Russia, you, you know, the, the, the people's revolution, it, it will happen. And, and I don't know how it's going to happen, but there will be change. But I do think the one thing that people have never had, individuals have never had, is a voice on a global scale. And eventually, that's why, look at how many people have already taken to YouTube. I mean, yeah. you, can go, you can go find tutorials about, I don't know, horticulture. How, like if I, I don't, I, I wanna be able to plant roses in my backyard. I can go watch videos that people have made about how to plant the ultimate rose garden. And, yeah. and it's amazing. And I think that if, and people do it for free. They make the, it's all out there. You don't even have to pay. And, and eventually people are going to, are going to stop being angry and they're going to slowly discover that there's a lot of voices to hear that are inspiring. Like mm -hmm. even I get lots of people that call me. I, I just, one day my girlfriend bought me a microphone and said, go ahead. Now finally start your YouTube channel. And you know, a year and a half later, you contact me from Poland and say, can we talk about the things you talk about on your show? Like I wouldn't have even known who you were or, and you wouldn't have known who I was. And now here we are a year and a half later from buying this microphone that I'm talking to you with right now. We're having a conversation across the planet. Yes. Isn't that optimistic? It is. I agree. And then it shows me that, that the, the, the corporate approach to, it seems that many people involved in uh, content creation are very aware of the educational aspect of what they're doing, be it, you know, tutorials uh, explicitly or yeah. the, 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 the short films or the movies that they're doing. And it's interesting to me that, that uh, you know, as you describe those different phenomena in, in new media, how in comparison heavy handed the education is dealt with by corporate movies, by studio movies where this is something that obviously is a, is a trigger topic on, on YouTube and on Twitter, when a movie comes out and people feel that they're force fed a specific ideology, be it political mm -hmm. or gender or race or something. And in comparison, uh, first of all, comparing to older movies uh, where this was, I don't think that it was con conceivable on this, on this scale, you often cite uh, The Godfather and, you know, kind of the wisdom that is put into the character was not with the idea of, okay, let us educate the public with some wisdom. It was more about, let's create a character that is fascinating. And then yep. there's automatically some, some, something educational coming out that, is, that does not feel as if it's force feeding me. And I, I don't create this automatic resistance. And on the other hand, the new media seems to do that automatically if it's not guided by conspiracy agendas or something, but just perceiving people of, of how they are and how they articulate themselves in the normal environment 
is so much more satisfying and teaches me so much more about this particular individual, but then I can extrapolate. It's like, oh, if this person is like that, maybe there are other people like that who are nuanced or reasonable or are angry about a specific topic. And I'm so much more willing to get it from these sources than from, from something that looks like, you know, an immature uh, educational kind of theme wrapped up in, uh, you know, in the context of a movie that's supposed to entertain me. Yeah, I, I, it's so strange to me that that now we have, like I just used as an example, uh, Star Trek, which is something that I I grew up with my whole life. And, and I call it the great Star Trek hostage crisis that began 11 years ago when Star Trek 2009 came out. When, when Star Trek now, the Star Trek that's been made over the last 11 years is actually really about Star Trek. Hmm. Like they, they pay lip service, like they've taken this thing and they've, again, they've turned it into a total corporate entertainment deal. Like it's, they think to themselves the whole reason like, oh, well, Star Trek has been, people have been fans of it for 40 years. So let's turn it into an entertainment franchise like everything else. Hmm. Well, Star Trek was never like that. It was it, it, it barely survived when it was originally on the air in the 60s. And one of the great things about Star Trek was because at the time you couldn't deal with certain subjects like the Vietnam War. They would there's a second season Star Trek episode called A Private Little War that's about a a battle between these these villagers and the hill people and they're being armed by an alien faction. The village people are, and then the hill people have to be armed by the Federation. And it was an allegorical tale of what was going on in Southeast Asia. But in the context of an action adventure science fiction show, they could get away with telling that story. And smart people would be like, oh, I see what you're doing here. Well, nowadays, Star Trek, they'll even tell you, the creators of Star Trek will tell you, we'll look at our diversity in our show and look at, we've got all these different people represented. And, and I'm like, you've already lost. If you have to come out and tell me what I'm supposed to take away from your program, you have lost. You have not done what you're supposed to do is tell me a great story that I can mull over and think about long after I've seen it. Like what all the great stories do. They never talk about that. They always talk about, now, well, let me tell you how, you know, uh, the, what our show is really all about. And I think that's such a strange thing because before, great stories have all of those themes. They're already baked into the tale. Exactly. They're already yeah. part of, uh, if you go back and you, you study poetics or something or some of the great, uh, all the great stories, they've been, they've been told for thousands of years. It's not like anything, there's not much, a great story has been a great story for thousands of years, like you, we have not reinvented the paradigm of storytelling. You know, you have a protagonist, something happens to that protagonist and good or bad. And the protagonist responds to those things. And because stories are inherently, they're about people. I mean, they can be about furry animals in an animated show, but they're still proxies for people. They're all about the truths of what our lives are like. And when our lot, like we don't, we don't walk out the front door and go, Today, I'm going to explain to somebody why they should like the fact that I'm so diverse or let me explain what my uh, gender fluidity is about to you. You know, nobody wants to hear that because uh, they don't necessarily understand it. That's not their experience of the world. And what a story, a good story does is allow everybody, whether you're a man, a woman, old, young, however you represent or, or however you identify with your gender or your sexuality, when you're watching a protagonist go through a storyline, you should be able to understand that protagonist, even though you're different from that protagonist, because the story itself, you're putting yourself in the position of the protagonist as you're watching it, experiencing it. You're always asking yourself, well, what would I do? And the story sucks you in going, what if this happened to me? Like Franz Kafka's The Trial. What if somebody just threw me in jail and put me on trial and you said, well, what have I done? They wouldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. I, we, we're not telling you. You're just being prosecuted for it. Well, everybody understands that. You know, everybody gets that, oh my God, that's a terrible, I would hate to be in that situation. What would I do? You know, it's a kangaroo court in people that, 
that lived under, you know, the Soviet system, going to the Gulag Archipelago, you know, or whatever, Solzhenitsyn or whatever, you know, I mean, people understand those concepts. And that's what storytelling should be all about. You shouldn't lead with whatever uh, message you're going to tell. That should be part of the tale that you're telling. It should be, and nowadays, that's what's happened to a lot of this storytelling and it's false storytelling. Even though stories are made up, they're telling false stories that don't ring true. And that's why people are getting mad. You know, I think one of the really interesting things about superhero movies, and the reason I think that the MCU is popular is because within that paradigm of a superhero movie, there's truth in that genre. They're telling truthful stories to people. You know, people can argue like, well, I don't think that's what time, time travel doesn't work like that. I mean, you know, which is silly, but you're arguing over something that doesn't exist, but I get it. It's a literary trope, but still those stories, you, you get involved because within the paradigm that the Marvel universe has created, those stories are being true to themselves. However, the Star Wars stories that have been told are not. The new Star Wars prequel trilogy that we've just finished up, uh, The Force Awakens, Rise of Skywalker, and, um, or the, and um, Last Jedi, those stories do not feel true to the Star Wars paradigm. They, they have been made by a corporation that ticked off boxes that wanted things that they needed so they could promote. They're like, we need a female character because we want to appeal to more girls, the people that love the Disney princesses, so we can put Ray in. So the, the people that love Star Wars, they might not know why these, so they're looking for reasons. Why are these stories no longer fulfilling to me? Hmm. And they're like, because they're agenda-based. But the agendas that they're, they're like social justice, they're the wrong agendas. The agendas are to make money. That's what they want is that. And so, and, and Kevin Feige knows over at Marvel, he knows that if I stay true to the paradigm that I'm working in, I will make money, you know, because the comic book medium, this, the whole idea of the superhero stories, he worked on 13 Marvel based movies before he created the Marvel cinematic universe that Disney now owns. So he saw within the superhero paradigm what works and what doesn't work some movies work like the x-men movies or sam raimi's spider-man but even in that paradigm certain x-men movies were better than others so he saw what worked and what didn't work so he's able to successfully 23 movies that if you average out have each made a billion dollars that's a huge success but he's doing it because he's in control and can make sure that those stories are true to themselves and I think ultimately you have a bunch of angry fans on the internet and I'm angry about Star Trek. Other people are angry about Star Wars. You can scream and yell all you want, but it's because the stories that we're getting are untrue, which is funny to say about fiction. Yeah. This fictional story is not true and I'm mad about it, which is absurd. But I think it's also true that, that, that we're, getting, we're getting fake fictional stories that aren't true to themselves because even great fiction has to be truthful it has to have verisimilitude and when your fiction doesn't if your fiction does not have a quality of reality and it's so silly to talk this way because people are like come on rob how is there reality in a star wars movie and i'm like well if you watch star wars and empire strikes back the first two movies there is a reality there there's a universe that's created they give you all the rules of the universe they tell you how the rules work and the storylines within that universe, you're watching how a man, a, a boy through travails and through his adventures, whether it becomes a man or a Jedi and it all feels true within that universe yeah. and you believe it. And I think that that's because you basically had a core group of creative people that were not thinking well, we, we have to do this to make money because we want to have a theme park and lunch boxes and toys and all. They were thinking that. But when they first started out, they didn't realize that they were even going to have that opportunity. So as you move through, I mean, George Lucas, he got really rich and, and, and that's what happens when you get successful. But the first, I think the first two Star Wars films, Star Wars and Empire, 
are a great example of stories, fictional stories that are true within the paradigms that they created for themselves. And now we live in a world where everybody wants those franchises that make all kinds of money across many different platforms, but they've forgotten how to make the stories themselves true. And then they realize that, oh, we've failed. So we need to find, again, this is why I'm optimistic. Then they have to find creators that know how to tell those stories again. So their core business, they can start uh, monetizing those, those true stories. So people will, will come back and watch them. Because if people aren't watching your stories, their main stories like Star Trek and Star Wars both have suffered. They're not selling merchandise from either the Rise of Skywalker or Star Trek Discovery because no one likes the stories. So they don't, they don't want a, a spaceship sitting on their desk at work. They don't want to be you know, surrounded by the action figures I'm surrounded by because they're not true. You, know, you, you have a character, you buy an action figure because you like that character. That character speaks to you. And if the characters don't speak to you, if you don't believe them, then you don't want that character sitting on your desk at work. And interestingly, it seems that it's necessary to rediscover something that novel writers have known for centuries, which is you need to create a good story. Uh, you can be fictional. Fantasy was always a genre. Uh, science fiction came up later, but still. Uh, you have to create something that people can relate to. And this is where maybe we can close off again with the, with the topic of the discourse. You have to somehow connect to where people are, to connect to their experience and to their reality and just contribute enough new and a different perspective so that they are willing to go there. Yes. And this is partly, this is automatically kind of created, I think, by the small creators. On, on YouTube, uh, this uh, it, it often doesn't need a lot of overhead. And it seems to be uh, more and more difficult and more clumsy when kind of big money gets involved. And eventually I hope that your optimism uh, is true and so that they will kind of learn the lesson and let those genuine voices speak again. In the end, I am very grateful for our conversation. Thank you so much for your time, Rob. Uh, I will end the recording pretty soon, but maybe we can have a few minutes to wrap it up also. Well, no, I, I agree with you. And I think what's really interesting, if you look at some of like in America now, two of the best television shows of the last couple of years have been Breaking Bad and its sequel, Better Call Saul. Hmm. These are two shows that are uh, wonderfully made programs that both deal with I guess you'd call it maybe the corruption of the soul. Uh, mm -hmm. What all, what modern life can do to you, what, what ambition can cause you to how to compromise yourself. But they're, they were created by the same people. Vince Gilligan, the main creator who worked on shows like the X-Files, he created the show and the core team really knew what they were doing. And the shows just got better and better as they went along. Now they weren't interfered with. Hmm. And those shows, because they had such truth in them, were also financially successful. So then the, the bean counters, the people that ran the money and, and, and look at what profit margins they're making say, okay, you guys keep doing what you're doing because yeah. what you're doing works. We don't, the, the real problem with especially movies and TV is because it also has glitz and glamor and because everybody watches movies and I've seen this for 30 years, every person thinks they know how to make movies and tell stories because they've been watching them. They don't understand the complexity of what it takes to actually, I mean, making a good movie, I always talk about verisimilitude, but you know, let's say you're going to shoot a scene of two people at a cafe talking. There's a million different decisions about how to do that to make it feel real. Yeah. Like what, what kind of a cafe is it? You know, what color is the tablecloth? What are they eating? Uh, how many people are around them? What time of day is it? Uh, what season? Is it winter? Is it fall? Is it spring? And, and all of these decisions, and there's like a million different decisions in one little scene in a movie, and all of them have to be correct for your audience to believe that scene. Now imagine that in a movie. Every scene's the same, and there's all those decisions that go into a single scene. Yeah. Well, most people don't even think that way. And, and then 
they um they, they don't understand well why wasn't this movie good because they have no understanding of how many decisions have to be made in order to make a scene feel real but everybody thinks well i watched a movie so i must know how to make them but ultimately it's those creators they will win out the creators that do great work because those are also the creators luckily that i think make the most amount of money in the long run the best creators the work usually rises to the top and like you said why is it so many big budget movies fail because it's really really hard to make truthful movies that stand the test of time that audiences flock to again and again they have to be great and making great movies like any other kind of art is really hard. And people who are making great art aren't necessarily in it for the money, even though the people that are giving them the money to make that art are. And I do, I am, I'm optimistic because true creativity does usually win out in the end. And I hope that our audience takes away from our conversation that it's good to have high expectations and it's good to demand from productions that they're actually satisfying and not to be satisfied just with uh, the, uh, the visual effects and the cheap thrills that come with one viewing. So Rob, thank you again for your time. Uh, I will stop the recording here. Any last words for our recording? No, I, I just think it's, it's a real pleasure. And once again, it's just amazing to me that I can have a conversation with you across the planet. We can have interesting discourse and, you know, it's a Thursday. We're recording this for me on a Thursday morning. It's a Thursday evening for you. Mm -hmm. And I think in a way, wasn't this one, the conversation was enriching for both of us. And hopefully the people that listen to it are also enriched. And we could have had this conversation like we did 20, uh, 20 years ago. True. And these are one and a half, two hours that we decided to spend on this and not to watch on something meaningless. So in the end, your optimism is justified. This proof is in the pudding. This conversation alone proves my point. Thanks again to Robert Meyer Burnett and his engaged discussion. And please go and check him out on his YouTube channel, The Burnett Work, and the diverse topics and audiences he engages with there. Also check out other episodes of my Curious Mind podcast, where I discuss various psychological topics. And if you're interested in online therapy, Go to my website, elliscounseling.com to find more information.